without spreading concern. Before we can safely come together, we need the facts on COVID-19 vaccines. Visit GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. As a community, we build empathy, curiosity, joy, and connection when we share stories with you. Welcome to Storytellers Project, part of the USA Today Network. Hello, everyone. I am Kayla White. I'm a journalist with the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com in Phoenix, and I will be your MC for tonight's Storytellers Project show about fashion and culture. So welcome. We so appreciate you taking a chance on us and spending your evening listening to live storytelling. Tonight, we're joining Humana and five Americans from across the country for this show. Since 2016, the Storytellers Project has worked to produce more than 100 shows in communities across the country. But we're online only now for the time being, because while some feel unsafe being in theaters, it still feels essential to come together and share our stories and connect. So we've handpicked incredible, inspiring storytellers from across the country who will share their stories with you tonight. Please help me welcome our storytellers from across America. We have Wendy Farrell of Phoenix, Christian Allaire of New York City, Carolyn Marshall Covington of Raleigh, North Carolina, Irene Michaels of Chicago, and Jenny Walter of Gilbert, Arizona. All right, so what to expect for tonight's show? Um, it's not a TED Talk. It's not an instructional lecture. It's not a Toastmasters talk, a how-to, or really anything like that. Instead, it is personal storytelling. And the good news is listening to personal storytelling is a lot like visiting a friend. You sit down, open your heart and mind to deeply listen to somebody who you want to learn more about and connect with. And that's what we ask you to do tonight. You see, some of the storytellers you hear tonight will be really casual and conversational. Some, were, some might be more polished and professional. And we ask that you listen to them all and receive them with an open heart because that's how community connecting really happens. And it's particularly vital in times of change like this. So I'm very excited to be bringing you this show about fashion and culture. I emceed this show when it was at the Phoenix Art Museum two years ago, obviously very different times. And, you know, I took the prompt fashion as an opportunity to go a little bit avant-garde. So I remember I wore a pretty modest matte black knee length um, dress and it had a full cape around it. And I didn't notice until it was in photos that I kind of looked like a goth pope, um, which was very fun. Today I'm serving more like Jack Sparrow. But see, to me, fashion is really fun. It's creative. It's a place to experiment. But it can be so much more than that. Fashion can help us understand ourselves. It can help us communicate to others who we are. It can help transform us. It can take us through times of change. And that's what tonight's show is all about, the power of style. So with that, I'd like to bring up our first teller for the show, Wendy Farrell, who has a story about the power of costume. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Kayla. Well, I've done a lot of adulty things in my life, but the truth is I might actually be a nine-year-old. Now, please don't tell anyone at the Phoenix Art Museum. Um, they just put me on the board of the Arizona Costume Institute, and they might be shocked to discover that I'm kind of immature. Now, ACI, Arizona Costume Institute, isn't about costumes like a play or a movie. It's more about fashion and the way we dress. Now, if I were to be honest with you, I would have to say that I've always viewed the way I dress as a sort of a costume. What am I doing today? What do I want the world to think of me? When I was a little kid, I actually had a box of old clothes I found in the attic, and I called it my dress up box. Now in that box, I vividly recall a dress made with dotted Swiss, which is, had red polka dots on a white field. It was a really full skirt. And when I put that dress on, I could be a queen, a princess, a debutante, really just about anything. There were also men's clothes and I'd put on a suit coat and a hat and I would talk like this because apparently when you're little, you think that big men talk like this. Bah, 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 bah. It was a lot of fun. Now, when you think about it, dress up for a kid is pretending. 
dress up for an adult is aspirational, dressing for the job you want or where you're going to go that night. Now, I was never that kid who had the right brand name on the back pocket of my jeans or the right animal on the, the front of my soft collar shirt. My parents, when they valued being clean and appropriate, did not value brands or logos at all. So I had an eclectic closet, a few handmade items, a lot of thrift store finds, and the few precious items that I could persuade my mother to buy at the store. I assembled that closet like my own personal costume department. If I was wearing a skirt, I would undoubtedly swish. If it was a full skirt, count on me twirling. I do recall having a three-piece woman's suit, blue pinwheel corduroy that I wore with a newsboy cap, my hair in braids down the side. I thought I was all that, very fashionable. Chances are I wasn't, but I felt good, so that was what was important. My family undoubtedly thought I had little sense of self, but I've later learned that all of those characters are who I was and who I am today. If only somebody had mentored me to do that when I was younger. Now, when I got to high school, I discovered the theater department and suddenly I had my tribe. I did every play for four years, starting as an orphan in Oliver my freshman year. Then I started sewing my own costumes, including a red polka dot dress to play Ada Annie my junior year in high school in the musical Oklahoma. It was so much fun. It was my heyday. I was where I belonged. But then senior year in high school came and my father came to me and said, it's time for a serious major. In other words, not theater. Well, I don't recall any discussion of me needing to be able to support myself or even being successful, just time to be serious. How odd that like my namesake, Wendy in the movie Peter Pan or the book Peter Pan, I was told to grow up and get out of the nursery. Well, I did. I did a serious major. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science from the College of Agriculture at the University of Vermont. I married my college sweetheart. I did everything I was supposed to do. And quite frankly, when I look back at those years, my costume was very bleak and my life might have been a little bit boring. Hmm. But then Becca was born and I poured all of my creative energy into her. I put her in outfits that were polka dotted and checked with ruffles and lace. So much whimsy, so much fun. When she was only one year old, I made her a fur suit costume for Halloween. That little one-year-old didn't know what we were doing to her. We told her we dressed her as the family dog. Well, she may have thought mom was crazy, but mom was having a great time. The next year, I made costumes for she and the little girl across the street as Winnie the Pooh and Tigger and hand-painted every single stripe on Tigger because I couldn't find the right fur in the store. Well, a couple years later, I found myself divorced and rebuilding my life. A friend invited me to go to something called Aresiacon in Boston, Massachusetts. Now the Aresiacon focuses on sci-fi and speculative media. And I got there and discovered they had a costuming competition on stage. They called it a masquerade. And in the halls, there were people dressed in all sorts of costumes, fantasy costumes, historic costumes, ethnic costumes. Suddenly I had an excuse to dress up again. I was liberated. I could be that little girl who tries on different characters once again. I joined the Northern Lights Costumers Guild and helped them build a giant Chinese patchwork dragon. It was incredible. A couple of years later, I actually entered my daughters. Now I had Becca and Aresia. Yes, we named Aresia after the convention. And they went in the masquerade as a princess and her dragon. Becca as the princess and little toddling Aresia as a dragon. She walked onto stage and wouldn't surrender the cookie she'd been eating. There was drool coming down her chin. I'm sure she's glad I'm sharing this with you. And the audience collectively went, aww. I was hooked. Having somebody react so emotionally to something I'd created was a high that I've never gotten over. Well, a couple years later, my husband and I joined the troupe and we were truly a family act. 
But then there was the turning point. Our lucky charm was my stepdaughter, Tracy, who joined our family group and went on stage. And we did Charlie's Steampunk Angels, all clad in olive green and demonstrating our strange proclivities that got us kicked out of the Temporal Police Academy. And when we hit that iconic 70s show poster, like this at the end of our act, well, the audience went crazy. And guess what? We won best in show. We went from being novice costumers to journeymen. A couple of years later, we did another performance that promoted us from journeymen to master costumers. Now we've added a few friends into our act. Our show keeps getting bigger and bigger every year. <sighs> Do I have a favorite performance? No. That would be like choosing a favorite child. I definitely can't do that. One thing we are committed to doing are twisted tales that get a reaction from the audience. Our last performance was January, 2020 at the Eurasia Convention, just before COVID shut the world down. We did in 60 seconds, the entire first season of BBC's program, Gentleman Jack. Now that ended with Ann Lister on one knee proposing to her lady love with a pride flag up behind her. The audience went crazy. And once again, we won best in show. It's a pretty heady experience. That's probably what I've missed most of all during the COVID shutdown, that audience reaction, having somewhere to go and get new experiences. I tried sewing masks for a little while, but it really didn't get my creative juices going. That's one of the reasons I'm really glad things are opening up again. We have an excuse to dress up, to do fun things, even if it's just putting on the right baseball cap with the right logo uniform and going to a baseball game. Go team, that's fun, that's dressing up. But even better than an audience reaction is what my daughters are doing now. Tracy, well, she has an entire costume closet for LARPing, that's live action role playing. Kind of like Dungeons and Dragons with costumes and fake swords, often out in the woods. She loves it. Becca is a professional costume designer about to start her master's at the University of Maryland. And Arisha, well, her closet has a lot of evening gowns and other beautiful attire that help her prepare to represent herself. And she's competing for Miss Arizona USA in July. Watching those girls become self-confident and truly tell the world who they are, that is the best reward of all. My dad, when he taught me a lot of great lessons, didn't realize that I need to play. I need to dress up. Back in May, May 24th to be exact, it's tiara day. Well, I wore a crown or tiara all day long to yoga, to run my errands, to go out to dinner. And people kept coming up to me saying, is it your birthday? And I'd say, no, it's tiara day. I had so many fabulous interactions, many with complete strangers. I strongly suggest it. It's a lot of fun. Playing makes me happy. My husband says I'm the world's tallest nine-year-old. And after hearing my story, I strongly suspect you agree with him. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that story. It is beautiful to hear how you've been able to share that hobby and passion with your children and your family. What a blessing. It's so much fun. I would imagine. Um, viewers, just as a reminder, you can clap for our storytellers with likes and reactions. All right, thanks again. Before I bring up the next teller, I would like to just take one minute to thank a sponsor. Humana has sponsored Storytellers Project shows nationally and now virtually because they believe that sharing stories and connecting as humans, both in online and in person, makes for healthier people and healthier communities. And we need those connections to each other and to our health now more than ever. As the COVID-19 vaccine becomes available in communities across the country, Humana strongly encourages you to get the vaccine and to talk to your healthcare provider about what is right for you. So visit Humana.com to learn more about what they're doing to connect you and communities with health. All right. Now let's bring up our second teller for the, for the show, Christian Allaire, who has a story about connecting with his culture through clothing. Welcome, Christian. Thank you, miigwech. Anin, my name is Christian Allaire. I'm indigenous from the Ojibwe tribe from Nipsing First Nation. And this is the story of a magical ribbon shirt. 
a transformative ribbon shirt that really had more power than I thought it would. When I was a baby, when I was one or two, my grandmother Lita made me a traditional ribbon shirt. Um, ribbon shirts are worn by many different tribes for many different reasons. But in my Ojibwe culture, ribbon shirts are really reserved for a special occasion. You would wear it to a powwow or a special event in your community. And even though I was a baby at the time when I got it, I would later learn in life it holds a lot of value. Um, I remember this shirt so vividly, partly because I still have it, but it really was a beautiful piece. It's red and it's adorned across the chest with ribbons in yellow, black, and white. The color choice of a ribbon shirt is probably the most important part of it. Um, my grandmother Lita chose those colors because it's the colors of our medicine wheel teachings. And basically in that photo of the four colors, it represents living a balanced life. And for her making this shirt, she wanted me to live a balanced life. Um, and it just so happened to be very beautiful too. Um, growing up, I really was um, always around my family making stuff. You know, not only did my grandmother sew, my mom sewed, my aunt sewed, my sister was a jingle dress dancer. So I was always exposed to really beautiful things. Yet I never really asked for more regalia after that first ribbon shirt. In fact, that ribbon shirt was the only one I had for many, many years. Uh, and there was a reason for that. You know, growing up, in school around my friends, I didn't really see a lot of indigenous kids like myself, let alone did I see traditional regalia being worn. And so when you don't see your friends or your close, you know, people in your class wearing something, you, you start to question it. I, I suddenly became a little bit self-conscious or embarrassed by my cultural clothing. And that was the last thing I wanted to wear. At the same time as all these feelings, I also had a lot of my friends being like, well, you don't look indigenous. You're not indigenous. Um, and, you know, my mother is indigenous, but my father is white. You know, I'm, I'm what com people consider a half breed. And so I may not look indigenous, but I certainly am. But those, those comments stayed for me for, with a, for a really long time and um, really affected my point of view with fashion and cultural clothing. Um, there was a kind of a sense of shame that lingered there. Um, this continued well into high school uh, where I experimented with many questionable fashion trends. Uh, I was a goth for a minute. I was a preppy boy the next minute. I was desperate to try any look that was not my commute from my community or my culture. Uh, as long as it wasn't a ribbon shirt, I was game to try it. <laughs> um, but when I started really starting thinking about being a writer, which I am now, and really becoming interested in fashion, I started thinking about my culture again because I saw it not really being written about anywhere in magazines. Um, and through that, I started meeting really cool indigenous writers and designers and models um, while I was studying in Toronto. And I, I remember thinking for the first time, okay, this is kind of cool. Like, you know, seeing my cultural clothing in new ways, whether it be streetwear or formal wear, I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Maybe I should be wearing this again. But I wasn't quite ready for a ribbon shirt yet, but it had me thinking. Now I'm a writer at Vogue and writing about indigenous fashion has become kind of my thing. And um, I really have started delving into this world. And a great example of this is when I um, attended the Santa Fe Indian market, which happens every summer. I went about two years ago to cover just the market. And if you've never been, I'll explain it to you. It's this amazing market where Artists from across North America, indigenous artists come and they sell their work. You know, they bring beadwork, quill work, anything you can think of. Things that I was exposed to as a kid, I was now seeing, you know, a national array of artists doing. And I was really amazed. And not only that, but every single night at this market, there's, you know, fashion shows, dinners, parties. And people are showing up to these events in their cultural couture. 
it's basically like a fashion show every night. Um, and, you know, I was meeting people and they were telling me about these garments that their family had made from scratch. And I was there in my Zara clothing that I bought off the rack. I suddenly felt very underdressed. And even though I'm very much a part of that world and that community, I didn't own a single piece of Indigenous clothing. <laughs> it was kind of like an aha moment. And I realized this needs to change. So flash forward to the pandemic summer of last year with nothing but thoughts, uh, I kind of came to the conclusion, I need a ribbon shirt. It's been far too long and it's time. I was a little bit nervous about asking my mom to make a ribbon shirt for me. I didn't know how she would react because I had shunned it for so long. But when I asked her, it was almost kind of like she had been waiting for this moment her whole life. She was so excited and she immediately called up three of my aunts on the phone and she said, we're making a ribbon shirt. And that really was, became a fun quarantine summer task, you know, through fittings and through many discussions, we landed on an adult ribbon shirt for me that's really a rep, you know, replica of the one I had as a kid. You know, my grandmother has since passed, but we kind of wanted to bring her spirit forward and keep her alive through fashion. And so we did the same design, ribbons across the chest, but the only difference was we updated the colors. And what I ended up doing was I wanted to represent all of my elders, you know, my parents, my grandparents, my dad's grandparents. Um, I collected all of their favorite colors because my mother knew, my dad knows. And through this shirt, it ended up being a multicolor array, literally every color of the rainbow. Um, it just so happened that it worked out that way. And I did that because I just, I really wanted to represent where I come from and who I am today. And it's because of that. And so I wanted that reflected on the shirt. There was also a lot of other special details that went into the shirt. Um, on the back, there's an image of a crane, a fairly large image. Um, that was embroidered to represent my crane clan. And even the smallest details, um, we used abalone shells, which is a material we've used for decades and continue to use. Um, and through all of this design process, I knew I would get a beautiful shirt out of it. I knew that, but I didn't really expect to be so moved by the design process. You know. While they, my aunts and my mom were making it, they were teaching me so much about our culture. And I realized Indigenous fashion is more than just a pretty garment. It's embedded with such history and meaning. And it kind of took me a long time to get there, but I finally realized that now. And the joke was on me because now I have this beautiful shirt and nowhere to wear it. You know, this was the heart of the pandemic, even now. You know, the world is opening up, but I haven't been to any big fashion shows or Santa Fe markets, and I've yet to wear the shirt. Um, and so the ironic part of this whole story is a shirt that I once would rather be got dead in, to be honest, and I would used to make up excuses not to go to powwows. Now it's the only thing I want to wear. Um, and whenever that is, I know I'll be wearing it for myself, and I know I'll get a good photo out of it, which I'm very much hopeful for, but I know it's gonna be more than that. I'm really gonna be wearing it for my grandmother, um, and I hope she's proud that I'm finally proud to wear my culture, and I'm really doing it to honor my ancestors because it's up to me and our generation and the next generation to continue these design traditions and to keep them alive, because if we don't, who else will? And it took me 28 years to get there, but I'm very glad that uh, I finally got there. And that's the story of my beautiful ribbon shirt. Thank you. Christian, how lovely that, uh, you know, just creating a shirt could connect you so deeply to your ancestors and to your mom and to your family now. You know, I think a lot of us in the pandemic have revisited clothes we thought about or wanted as a child, but um, I will say yours is much cooler and more meaningful than mine. I bought a band shirt for My Chemical <laughs> Romance. So different, different times, but in all seriousness, <laughs> I cannot wait to see you debut that shirt. I'm sure there will be an Instagram post and I will 
like it as fast as possible. There will be. <laughs> Me <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again, Christian. All right, next up is Carolyn Marshall Covington, who has a story about building a career in fashion and beauty. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you very much. I'm sitting over here having a flashback to July the 2nd, 1973. And it was a very special day because it was my 13th birthday. And I finally got my first pair of high top Converse sneakers. And I couldn't wait to swap out with my best friend. She had a black pair. We decided to wear one red and one black sneaker to camp. And the very next day, everyone was swapping out sneakers. And that, my friend, is how street fashion began in my neighborhood. You know, they say the Converse sneaker is a classic. And just recently, our Madam Vice President was featured on the cover of Vogue magazine. It might have been the February issue. And she wore a stunning business suit and a pair of Converse sneakers. Now, if you ask me, fashion is like a piece of art. It's thought provoking and it can cause controversy. Some people like it and some people don't. But who is to say what is right or wrong in fashion, especially if it's merely an expression of you? Well, my fashion journey began at 21 years old when I was blessed to open in-flight hair salon at such an early age. And every day in the salon was just like a mini fashion show. And about a year later, my team and I became platform artists and educators for one of the major hair product companies. And we got to travel to all of the trade shows and create the hair trends on stage. Wow. I think we became fashion addicts, and I must confess that I was a label junkie. I wore designer everything. I'd see the mannequin in the window at Saks, and I'd say, wrap it up, size eight, to alleviate any room for fashion faux pas. But I really didn't understand what fashion and culture was until I took a trip across the pond. And when I arrived at the London hair show, I was in shock to see every stylist was completely dressed in black. I thought, how in the heck did I miss that memo? And I just stood there frozen, looking like a mannequin with Gucci screaming all over my body. And as I looked around, I realized that each person was unique in creating their very own fashion statement. And I could appreciate their attitudes of not asking permission, nor seeking approval of anyone, and definitely not apologizing for their fashion choices. Hey, way to go. And while I was there, I stumbled upon the term capsule wardrobe. And it originated in the US in 1940s, but had been revived in the 1970s in uh, London with Sally Foe, who had a little London boutique named Wardrobe. Now you're probably wondering, what is a capsule wardrobe? Well, it's a small collection of garments that have been designed to be worn together and they harmonize in color. And I totally fell in love with capsule wardrobe dressing. <laughs> and I was so done with the mannequin shenanigans, <laughs> but, Shortly after I had to go to the Chicago hair show and when I arrived there, everyone had started dressing in all black. So I was in sync. And while I was preparing the models here for a fashion show, all these racks of designer garments were surrounding me. And I thought, I wonder what it would be like to have an outfit that was made specific to, to my body measurements and especially for me. And while I was backstage, I got to meet David Bird. He was one of Chicago's top fashion designers and he was accepting new clients. And so he interviewed me right on the spot. He asked about my lifestyle, my personality and my level of confidence. And then he measured me inch by inch and he noted every curve and every flaw on my body. And he said, all I had to do was trust that he would put all of the above into a garment that would complement me. And it was perfect timing because my 10th year high school reunion was coming up. 
and I have been voted one of the top five movies and shakers of the class of 78. You know, I have been truly blessed to have four hair salons. I was traveling around the world and was on the cover of the Black Passion International Hair Magazine, Volume 1. And, oh, almost forgot. I had just gotten engaged to Mr. Wonderful. My life was so amazing. It couldn't have gotten any better. So I called David up and he asked, what was my level of confidence? And I was floating on 100. I had to be fabulous. So a couple of weeks went by and a package arrived and inside was a little black and white, gorgeous silk tuxedo dress. Now, I know we discussed that I was not comfortable showing my toothpick legs, but I had to trust my designer. So I slipped into the dress and it fit me like a glove. And when I turned around that magical hemline in the back, it fell in a spot that totally reshaped my legs. And a note said, wear a six inch heel to firm up your calf. Hey, no problem. I had a sexy black patent leather shoe with snakeskin completely up the back. My outfit was fabulous. It was caduce to David. And next up was my hairstyle. And Janet Jackson had just hit the scene with her new hair extensions. And she made it fashionable to grow hair overnight with no questions asked. So I went from two inches of hair to 22 inches of long flowing hair. Now in today's world, that's the norm. But back in the eighties, that took a lot of confidence. And for my finishing touches that night, I, my only request to the makeup artist was to use my go-to red power lipstick. So the power was on and my two girlfriends and I, we hopped the limo to the reunion. And I thoroughly enjoyed reconnecting and catching up with all of my classmates. But what I really learned that night was your personality and your confidence can take you anywhere you want to go in life. It can even make you imagine that you have Tina Turner legs, if only for one night. Well, after age 30, the years keep rolling on the river, <laughs> you know, but life happens. And as I was building my beauty empire, I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, an eye disease, and it robbed me of my sight. And that so amazing, couldn't get any better life. It suddenly crashed. And for the first time, I felt out of control. My faith and my confidence was fading fast. But I always knew that God had been on my journey from day one. And I just had to recognize that he is in control of my destiny. And he gave me the power to reset, re reinvent, and repurpose my life. Hey, it was my hallelujah moment. And through it all, I never lost my passion for beauty or fashion. And someone asked, why does a blind girl need beauty or fashion if she cannot see? But take it from me. It's the feeling of knowing that you are beautiful inside and out that will lift your self-esteem and it'll build your confidence. And here's another frequently asked question. How does a blind person get dressed? Now, surely you've gotten dressed in the dark before and you manage to put one leg in your pants and then the other. Well, that's what we do daily, but we do have to fill the garment for the zipper or button or a tag to know the front from the back. And we use our fingertips to glide up the seam or slide across the hemline to know if the garment is on the correct side. You know, in the blind culture, our hands become our eyes and we're able to feel the texture of the fabric and the style of the garment. We also have access to the app, Be My Eyes, that will identify the colors for us. Well, it is now 2021 and we're coming out of the pandemic. And I have revived my capsule wardrobe to an easy comfort with style. And we've included 
labels inside that have embossed symbols to identify each garment so that I may be able to feel and create my very own fashion statements. And for those special occasions, I will call someone that I can trust to pull it all together. And yes, blind people want to feel fabulous too. Thank you. Carolyn, I really appreciate you giving us some insight into something few of us have experienced. And I also really appreciate that you came prepared with a patent leather six inch heel for your custom <laughs> dress. That is a level of iconic I hope to be. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. It's actually not possible to get COVID-19 from any of these vaccines because they are not using live virus. Short-term side effects that were observed in the leading COVID-19 vaccine trials included injection site pain and redness, fatigue, muscle aches and pains, joint pain, and headache. When one develops the short-term symptoms after receiving the vaccine, that in fact is a sign that the vaccine is working and that your body is marshalling its defense network. It's important to note that none of these vaccines can give you COVID-19 since they only express a protein from the virus that allows your body's immune system to generate antibodies. All right, now our fourth teller for tonight is Irene Michaels, who has a story about transformation. So please welcome Irene. Hello, everyone. When I was a little girl, I was very adventurous, ambitious, mischievous, always playing make-believe. And when I was about nine or 10 years old, I went to a dance class with my little neighbor who had asked me to go with her many, many times. I finally went, my mother took me, and I was watching her take these lessons, and I was so fascinated. I thought from that moment, I wanted to be a dancer. I didn't care if I was a good dancer or a bad dancer. I just wanted a pair of those tap shoes. They were fabulous. They were black, satin, shiny, with big black bows, and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a dancer with those tap shoes on. So I, I told my mother, please, I want to take lessons and that's what I want to do. So my mom said, of course. So we went to class the next week and I enrolled and I started dancing. And I took tap lessons and ballet lessons and jazz lessons. And the woman who owned the agency, her name was Clara Powell. And as I was working and studying, she had told my mother, that she thought I could be a very good dancer and that she would like me to be her protege. And of course, that was wonderful to hear because at that time we uh, came from very humble beginnings and dance classes were very expensive. So mother was happy, I was happy, Clara was happy and I studied with her for many years and actually I achieved my goal. I became a very good dancer. I danced on legitimate theaters all over the U.S., off-Broadway, on-Broadway, and I was very successful. As I was working as a dancer, uh, there was somebody in the audience that had asked the producer if he could have a meeting with me. And, uh, of course, he said yes. So uh, the producer and I did meet, and he had asked me if I would like to audition for a very popular daytime soap opera. And uh, I said, oh, no, not interested. Of course, I jumped on the plane to let the next day. And the soap opera was General Hospital. So I flew to L.A., I got the part, and I started working in General Hospital. While I was working on that TV soap opera, I started studying acting more seriously. And, of course, uh, I got into music and start playing the guitar and start learning songs. So I was very, very uh, interested in the performing arts and um, pointing in on my craft. As I was 
at the height of my career. My career was in full bloom. I had a horrific thing happen to me. The rug was pulled out from underneath me. I was in a very serious car accident. While I was in Chicago, I went home to visit my parents for Christmas. And as we all know, Chicago has some very snowy winters. And the driver in the car lost control of the car and smashed into another car. And I ended up underneath the car in front of us. I went through the windshield with all the jagged edges of glass. And the next thing I remembered was um, laying in an ambulance and hearing the doctor say, let's hurry and get her to the hospital. We want to try and save her eyesight. And so I went to the hospital. They did surgery. I woke up a few days later in my hospital room. And when I heard and listened to the extent of my injuries, I was devastated. I had sustained over 2,000 stitches in my face. I had an orbit blowout fracture. I had multiple fractures in the left side of my body. And I was frightened to look in the mirror. Matter of fact, I would take the mirror and look at each part of my face one day at a time. First, I held the mirror up and I looked at my chin. And then the next day I looked a little higher and I looked at my nose and my lips. And finally, by the last day, I was able to look at myself in the mirror. I was freaked out. I was so disfigured. I thought, how? Am I ever going to cope with this emotionally, physically, financially? This is how I earned my living. I just didn't know how I was ever going to survive. I dug really deep. I talked to my mother every day. She helped me through this. I believed in my faith and I knew that I would be able to survive. When I got home from the hospital, I started my quest to look for doctors who would repair my face. I went to more than a dozen doctors and all of them said, I'm sorry, Irene, we're not going to operate. It's too risky and you will not be happy with the results. And that was a big pill to swallow. But I didn't give up. I kept searching for a doctor that would help me. And I found one, Dr. Orntrack. He resides and practices in New York. So I flew to New York to meet him. And he said he could help me. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, that would be so great. How, how are you going to do this? And he said, it would be a long, tedious procedure and a long recovery. And I said, well, doctor, how long is long? And he said, 10 to 15 years. I said, you mean 10 to 15 weeks? And he said, no, 10 to 15 years. What was I going to do? We all know that the longest road starts with the first step. So that's what I did. Every single month for 15 years or more, I went to the doctor in New York and slowly he started to repair my face to the point where I started modeling and acting again. I was happy again. I was confident again. I even wrote a book on beauty. The book is called Eye on Beauty, 
living beautifully and luxurious beyond 50. Yes, I'm the author of a beauty book. It's unbelievable to me. A couple of years ago, I got married to a wonderful man and I dedicated my book to my mother as well. I'm very happy. So I have a message for everyone. And tomorrow's my 76th birthday. Don't want to forget that. Here is my message to all. I have three of them. One is never give up, no matter what. Two, it's not what happens to you, but how you handle it. And three, stay confident, because confidence never goes out of fashion. And that's my story. Irene, I so admire your perseverance and your resiliency, and I can only imagine what you've been through. So thank you so much for sharing your story. And I'm so glad to hear how you've found success and love since then. So thanks again. And also happy early birthday. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right. Before I bring up our last teller for the night, I'd also like to take a minute to thank another sponsor. So when Fairy Tale Brownies co-founders Eileen and David started their business in 1992, the two entrepreneurs were cooking out of a friend's catering kitchen and delivering and selling brownies at street fairs on the weekends. Today, they own a 37,000 square foot facility where they bake and ship more than 6 million brownies, blondies, and cookies every year. With teamwork, hustling, and a fair share of ups and downs, Fairy Tale Brownies has experienced a lot in 29 years of business. And so to celebrate that success, they're giving away two Fairy Tale Dozen gifts. You can enter for a chance to win one at brownies.com slash storytellers, and you'll also get a discount on a purchase. All right, so let's bring up our last teller for the evening. Welcome to Jenny Walter, who has a story about using fashion to get through times of change. Take it away, Jenny. So I grew up in a small greenhouse that had red and blue carpet um, with my parents and my sister, Shuggy, and my little brother, Jason. But next door lived my very best friend in the whole wide world at that point in time. And we called her friend Jennifer since we had the same name. And friend Jennifer had the luxury of being an only child and the absolute apple of her father's eye. So her dad would load myself, friend Jennifer, and my sister, Shuggy, into his convertible MG, and he would take us down to 7-Eleven for Slurpees and Oreos, something my family could never, ever afford. But the best thing about friend Jennifer being an only child was her amazing Barbie collection. She had a Barbie collection that was like Imelda Marcos meets the Kardashians. She had everything. She had the dream palace, the horse, the car, the pool, the blow up furniture, the Ken dolls, Skipper, you name it. But the best part was the amazing amount of clothing her Barbies had and the shoes and the accessories and everything. So while friend Jennifer and my sister, Shuggy, would fight, <laughs> I would be in the corner and dressing the Barbies and fantasizing about when it would be my turn to wear the ball gowns and the dresses and the accessories and when I was going to have a chance to sparkle like that. So now we fast forward and now it's my wedding day and I'm in the big white dress, the perfect flowers, the perfect venue. I look down the aisle and there's my perfect man. He's so handsome. Tuxedo, the goatee, the beautiful green eyes. It was a perfect moment. I was so happy. Finally, my Barbie fantasy was coming true. Fast forward four years and now we have two perfect children, a little girl and a little boy. 
We have a beautiful house in the suburbs. Everything's going perfect. And as my perfect family and I are driving down the freeway, my beautiful, handsome husband, who's still beautiful and perfect, but has become a little bit melancholy. And he explains that on our wedding day, he also felt like he wanted to be in the big white dress and that in his heart and soul and mind, he was a woman and sorry, and he was transgender. So that was not the easiest thing that we've ever um, done and worked our way through, but we did. So now we fast forward two more years past conversations and discussions and a lot of really deep digging to figure out what we were going to do. Um, so now my beautiful wife with the beautiful green eyes has decided it's now time to transition at work. So we had discovered that big box retail and shopping at the mall maybe was a little tricky for us because of the dressing room situations. Um, if you think people are um, disconcerting about transgender individuals in bathrooms, um, it's actually maybe even just a hair worse in dressing rooms. So that wasn't going to work out for us. So I, being the problem solver that I am, got onto my computer and typed in transgender women's business fashions. I hit enter and <laughs> well, clicked on the first site and apparently they thought that my wife would want to go to all of her business meetings in something strapless or backless or crotchless. Everything was made out of um, rubber or latex or um, I mean, just nothing but fabric. For some reason, they thought that all trans women must be allergic to cotton. I, d I don't understand. It was very sexualized. It was very kinky. It was very fetish. And my wife is not those things. She's a beautiful, elegant, intelligent, tall woman who wanted to look her best at her job. So I thought I could do better. And the websites themselves none of the models were transgender. They were all cisgender women, which didn't make any sense to me. So I went to the small business development center here in Phoenix and they got me started on how to open a business. Then I was introduced to Angela Johnson and Sherry Berry at Tempe Fabric, which is a fashion and business resource incubator. And Angela taught me how to do design, how to construct a garment, do all of the drawings, the measurements, everything I needed to learn about making the garment. Then Sherry taught me all about what production entails. So my brand, Ava Scott, was born. Things were going well. I was making samples. I was learning so much. I had been chosen to participate in the designer in residence program at Fabric. Fantastic. 2020 was going to be my year. Ava Scott was going to launch. It was really going to hit. I had all these things lined up for pride, all of it. And then the virus hit. And I, it was like someone had poked a tiny hole in a balloon and the air was just slowly leaking out. And I sat on the couch for about two, three months, which felt like four or five years. And I started creating. And when I did, it was gowns and bridal and it was big and sparkly and full and foofy and fluffy. So, but there's no material, there's no production, there's no seamstresses. Everybody's making PPE and working on um, clothing that was vital to the pandemic and the frontline workers. So, uh, I had always decided to use transgender models for my fashions. It felt like that was the right thing to do, representation um, in a positive way, showing and showcasing the beauty of trans women was really important to me. It was a vital cornerstone of my business. So I had an idea of opening 
a modeling agency. I would specialize in trans women, transgender models really work on helping to bring their beauty to the forefront. So I contacted um, Randy England, who's a model and stylist, very, very well, highly respected here in Phoenix. And she said, why limit it just to trans models? She said, as someone who is petite and pierced and tattooed, I often find myself not being chosen for just those reasons. So she helped me to expand the idea of the agency. So now I represent trans models, LGBTQ, pierced, plus, tattooed, uh, petite, um, it, all different ages. I have some models who have some handicaps and limitations. So Willow Scott was born because I thought, aha, I can do better. So now fast forward, we've been open about a year. I have started with three models and now I have 40 models. And Randy had introduced me to a model here in town. Her name was Hannah Noel and she is fantastic. She is transgender. She is tall, willowy, beautiful, blonde, uh, brave, everything. She is, she is our brand ambassador and I'm so very proud. Uh, we've made some big strides here in Arizona and just the under the year that we've been open, we've had the first trans female model walk in Phoenix Fashion Week. We have continued to move forward and forward and forward. And the fashion brand has kind of taken a back seat at the moment. But all the while, I have been thinking about how much I enjoyed creating those bridal designs. And I actually have two right now that I am currently working on. The samples are done and I'm just tweaking the designs. And there, and from that, Noel Scott will be born. And that will be my bridal line. And I've come to realize that my fantasy and of dressing those Barbie dolls and those beautiful clothes, I, that's what actually what I'm doing now for a living. I am working with these amazing models, transgender female models, petite, plus all of these ladies who are so incredibly amazing and beautiful. And now I get to dress them up for real. So I have truly made my life exactly what I wanted it to be. Uh, my wife and I are still together. We just celebrated our 11th wedding anniversary. Our kids are nine and seven, and we are happy. We are blessed. We are content with our lives. And I'm very, very lucky to be able to work with women and help them to express and celebrate their authentic truth and to help them become that the women uh, become the women that they were always meant to be. So for me, that is truly a blessing. And I just want to say thank you. And remember, beauty is everywhere. Jenny, thank you so much for your story and for your work on behalf of the trans community. I know that while you were talking, I was opening a bunch of tabs like um, Noel, uh, <laughs> you know, like trying, trying to look at everything. Yeah. So I, I can't wait to, to look into everything you've introduced to us today. Thank you. Yeah, and happy anniversary. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that is it for our show today. Let's bring all of our tellers up for one final virtual bow and a wave goodbye. Um, while we're bringing them up, viewers, let us know what you thought in the comments, what you liked. All right. We're all here. Let's wave. I will take a <laughs> screenshot of that to post on my own social. Um, thank you again, everybody. And I hope you all enjoyed the show. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> and viewers, if you like...